It began with a love of nature. He was fascinated by the details of the natural world, something as simple as the amount of soil that an earthworm could turn up in the course of a day was a, a subject of wonder to him. And grew into a burning desire to understand. What are the laws of life? Can you imagine sitting down and saying to yourself, I'm going to tackle this question. What are the laws of life? That's what Darwin wrote to himself in his notebook. And the courage to speak the truth. To teach evolution in those years was to declare yourself beyond the scientific pale. You are a pariah. You are dangerous. Scientific adventurer, reluctant rebel, and the man who forever changed our place in the world. Charles Darwin, Evolution's Voice. Charles Robert Darwin lived a life dominated by a few powerful influences. He was born in 1809, in an age when men dared to explore profound questions. His hometown of Shrewsbury, England, was filled with beautiful countryside that imbued him with a love of nature. His invalid mother was often ill and unavailable to the young Charles. His father, Dr. Robert Darwin, was a wealthy aristocrat who ruled the family home with an iron hand. Robert Darwin was a strong individual, a physician, well-known, wealthy, a good investor, a figure who made his presence known in the countryside, almost a squire in the region in which he lived. Dr. Darwin prized his social standing and pressed Charles to always act respectably. In the evenings, the Darwin children sat and listened as their enormous 350-pound father expounded for hours on proper behavior. Charles felt alone in a crowd, intimidated by his father and distant from his five siblings. I don't think he had a lot of privacy. I don't think he had any territory that was genuinely just his. And so getting out into nature not only gave him some solitude, but gave him something that was his alone. And he became noted within the family and his circle of friends as the young collector. When Charles was eight, his mother succumbed to a wasting illness. Dr. Darwin insisted on order and decorum, discouraging the children from expressing their grief. Charles seemed unaffected by the loss of his mother. Yet just weeks later, he was overwhelmed by the sight of a military funeral. And as the coffin was lowered, a rifleman stood on and shot over the coffin. Emotions surged through the eight and a half year old boy and he never forgot that scene. He remembered it to his dying day, but he remembered nothing of his mother except the black gown she wore on her deathbed. He either never felt close to his mother, which seems to me unlikely, or he had repressed the closeness that he had felt and had buried that together with his grief. Beginning at age 13, Charles attended Shrewsbury School. This was 1822, when knowledge of ancient languages was considered the mark of a gentleman. Greek and Latin literature dominated the classes and left Charles completely bored. His lack of interest led to poor grades, convincing many that he was none too bright. Oppressed at home and school, he found freedom in outdoor life, becoming an expert horseman and hunter. He loved to bird hunt. Charles kept a, a log of every bird that he shot. He kept his hunting boots right next to the bed so that when he would jump up in the morning, he would put his feet right into his boots, grab his gun, and go out shooting. He didn't want to miss a moment. His sporting skills grew. His schoolwork went from bad to worse. Dr. Darwin feared that Charles was on a path to idleness and disrepute. In 1825, when Charles was 16, his father removed him from Shrewsbury School and sent him to study medicine at Edinburgh University. Medical students were required to witness surgery, and in the days before chloroform, the surgical theater resembled a torture chamber. Charles watched in horror as patients were strapped to the operating table and gagged to muffle their screams. He became overwhelmed by the suffering 
and fled from the room, never to return. He was too sensitive to become a doctor and too afraid of his father to admit failure. He remained at Edinburgh for over a year, hiding his shame. When he finally returned home, his father proposed a new route to respectability. His father said, all right, Charles, if you don't want to be a doctor, why not be a clergyman? You don't really have to believe in the faith all that much. Most clergymen don't, but don't tell your wife that. Uh, you keep it to yourself. Uh, you get invited to the best parties. You have a nice income, a nice house, and then you have all your time free for wandering around the countryside collecting beetles and bird's nests. Charles agreed to study for the ministry, eager for the chance to redeem himself. Thanks to his father's wealth and influence, he was readily accepted at Cambridge University. At age 22, he let loose and enjoyed the pleasures of youth. He hoisted a scotch or two or three and played blackjack until the wee hours of the morning. And he stepped out with a young lady named Fanny Owen, his first girlfriend. He seemed as aimless as ever until he met a man destined to change his life, Professor John Henslow, professional clergyman and amateur botanist, reignited Darwin's dormant passion for the natural world. So familiar was the sight of the two men taking long walks together that Darwin was dubbed the man who walks with Henslow. Darwin begins to play with nature. Uh, Darwin begins to engage in a way that nothing else had engaged in before that. So that although he took very few of any real courses in natural history or geology, he just imbibed it by being around people and by going into nature himself. He became an avid collector of plants and animals with a special zeal for gathering species of beetles. He grabbed a beetle in one hand and then he saw another rare species and grabbed it in the other hand. And then he saw a third beetle, and he really wanted that third beetle, so he popped the second beetle into his mouth to hold it while he grabbed the third beetle. But the second beetle ejected some foul-tasting fluid, and Darwin spat it out in disgust and also dropped the third beetle, so the whole incident ended with only one beetle and a bad taste in Darwin's mouth. He devoured long, multi-volume accounts of scientific exploration and dreamed of far-flung adventure. He neglected his studies and barely escaped Cambridge with a theology degree. Then, while visiting Shrewsbury, the mail arrived with a letter from Professor Henslow. The royal ship HMS Beagle, he wrote, would soon leave for an around-the-world voyage. Its captain was seeking a young gentleman to act as companion and naturalist. Would Darwin be interested? Darwin was wildly elated. He was just a fire to see the world. He was really full of enthusiasm to travel. But when he went to bed that night, all he wrote in his diary was refused offer of voyage. And the reason he had refused it was that his father, Dr. Robert, had not given him permission to go. Dr. Darwin really was afraid to lose his son. Thousands of young boys went out for adventure during the days of the British colonial empire and many of them never came back. He tried every which way to convince Charles that it was a bad idea. But when he saw that Charles was determined to go and had his heart set on it, he said, all right, if you'll show me one man of common sense uh, that will approve of this mad scheme, I'll go along with it. Charles found that man in his uncle, Josiah Wedgwood, who persuaded Dr. Darwin to fund his son's voyage. Charles was elated and apprehensive. Darwin didn't know how significant it would be. He didn't even know whether he would survive it. What he did hope is that he would be able to convince the people he respected most at home, those whose approval he craved, his father and his Cambridge professors, that he was able to make something of himself. He had a burning desire to do this. After 22 years as the wayward son, Charles was determined to make his mark he was abandoning a pretty young girlfriend and the family he loved for a leap into the unknown.
Charles Darwin had dreamt of traveling the world, and in 1831, his dream seemed within reach. The British Crown had assigned the HMS Beagle to map sea routes along South America, and its captain was seeking a naturalist for the voyage. The 22-year-old Darwin faced one final obstacle, approval from Captain Fitzroy. Fitzroy was a devotee of what then was called physiognomy, that you could read a person's character from the shape of their body or their face. And Fitzroy fancied that Darwin's nose was the wrong shape. They might not get along together. His gentlemanly manner and passion for the voyage won Fitzroy over. Darwin was overjoyed until he saw the beagle. He took one look at it. It was 90 feet long. It was small, 24 feet wide at the broadest point. It was small. He took a look at the cabin he was going to have to share. He had to stoop to get in. He was six feet tall, and the cabin ceiling was less than that. These were quarters which clearly brought a feeling of claustrophobia to him. From Darwin's letters to his sisters, to his father, to his friends, you get this sense of almost panic overtaking him. Should he back out now? But of course he couldn't. He knew that. He was a gentleman. He'd signed on. Darwin called the confined quarters an unremitting evil. He wondered how 74 men could live aboard for the next three to five years. And he learned that the vessel was a frigate, an unstable class of ship known as floating coffins. The ship was shore bound for several months, waiting for good weather. One night, some sailors became wildly drunk. The next morning, Fitzroy ordered them flogged. Darwin was appalled by the brutal discipline and wondered if he could endure a long voyage. He became so anxious that he developed chest pains. Finally, the beagle set sail, and he immediately discovered a new torment. The worst thing of all was seasickness. He was terribly prone to seasickness as all Darwins have been, including myself, right through generations. It's a bad gene to have. And uh, it, he, I mean, he vomited all the time. And what amazes me and other people is how he survived with all that seasickness, because he was going into some of the worst seas in the world. Not even sleep brought peace. His bed was a hammock stretching the full length of the cabin. And all night long, it swayed back and forth with nauseating regularity. After two months, the Beagle made landfall in South America. Darwin received his first letters from home and was dealt another crushing blow. When Darwin left on the voyage, he had a girlfriend. Her name was Fanny Owen. They used to lay down in the strawberry patch and eat strawberries together. And Darwin had a really warm spot in his heart for her. Fanny said she'd wait, but she didn't. Less than a year after he left, she married. Darwin was devastated by the news. But nature, his oldest love, filled the void. No human romance could equal the rapture of his first trek through the Brazilian rainforest. The elegance of the grasses, the novelty of the parasitical plants, the beauty of the flowers filled me with admiration. Such a day brings a deeper pleasure than I can ever hope to experience again. The mind is a chaos of delight. Charles Darwin. Tireless, he gathered fossils, skins, and carcasses from hundreds of exotic life forms. Wherever the beagle landed, he was the first to jump out, climb the mountains. He rode inland 400 miles with the rough banditti-like gauchos, as he described them, the cowboys of South America. And these were sort of rough, cutthroat guys. Darwin was a horseman. He kept right up with them. As a young man, he was very strong, very vigorous. His gentle ways endeared him to both native peoples and his crusty shipmates. The sailors called him philos, or philosopher, and considered him eccentric but harmless. They built barrels to hold his ever-growing collection of odd specimens. They figured whatever he was up to was important, and they were right. 
he had set himself the puzzle of decoding nature's complex web, one step at a time. He uncovered one critical clue on the cliffs above the city of Salvador. He looks up and he sees across the mountain a narrow band, what turns out to be seashells, absolutely steady across the territory, but much higher than the sea itself. And Darwin begins wondering what had happened. Had the earth been raised? Had the water been lowered? Christianity taught that the earth's surface had remained fixed since the biblical flood. His own observations told of an ever-changing planet. Ablaze with intellectual fervor, he seemed oblivious to potential dangers. In Argentina, he challenged the ruthless dictator, General Juan de Rojas. Darwin had to come to him and get a passport, and he listed himself as Don Carlos Naturalista. And they said, Naturalista? What is this Naturalista? Oh, he said through his interpreter, a, a naturalist is a man who is interested in everything, in anything. Aha, they said, a spy. Darwin managed to charm Rojas, gaining free passage and wrangling an escort through the dense forest. He was increasingly self-assured until encountering the savages of Tierra del Fuego. Nothing prepared him for the animal-like qualities, the nakedness, the primitiveness, sleeping coiled up together on the ground. He could hardly believe that the same God had created both humans so low and humans so high, like himself and the sherry-sipping professors at Cambridge. The experience convinced him that man is firmly rooted in the animal kingdom. All creatures on Earth are cousins to each other and all vulnerable to the whims of nature. Darwin came very, very close to not changing the course of Western history as they rounded Cape Horn for the first time. Mountainous seas there and the beagle was hit three times by enormous waves and finally on the third one tipped right over onto its side so that the poop cabin shipped water, the boats were torn loose. If there had been a fourth roller, that would have been all. Darwin had periodically crated up specimens and shipped them back to Professor Henslow in Cambridge. He received letters at various ports of call, but after two years, there was still no word from Henslow. He began worrying that his work was worthless, the entire journey a waste of time. Finally, a letter arrived. Henslow loved the collections and praised Darwin's brilliant work. Darwin was overjoyed. Henslow even spread word of Darwin's fossil finds among British scientists, turning Darwin into an instant celebrity. But his collections so far would pale compared to those from a tiny island chain off the coast of Ecuador. Little did he realize that his fate and the course of human history would turn on what he discovered at the Galapagos Islands. His first reaction to the islands was dismay. From a distance, they looked barren and hellish he realized on closer examination that they teemed with strange and exotic life. Day and age is in the most extraordinary place where man never really has lived until about the last hundred years, and none of the animals are frightened of man, which is so exciting. Darwin took advantage of their tameness and rode tortoise back on the giant creatures. He noticed that they and other animals existed with slight variations on each island. Finches on one island had long beaks for pecking insects. Those on another, heavy beaks for crushing nuts. And yet he realized that each species must hail from a common ancestor. The Bible said that species had been fixed at creation. The Galapagos suggested that animals could evolve. Darwin's discovery seemed to challenge God himself. 
He wrote to a new friend of his that it's like confessing a murder, but I have come to believe that species might change. In other words, evolution. Now, this was like a murder because, well, a murder is a capital crime. People are punished as murderers. Darwin felt that he would be punished. Darwin had struggled his entire life to follow the dictates of proper behavior laid down by his father. He had studied medicine and the ministry to fit into respectable society. Now his mind raged with an idea that threatened to upend the established order and to make him an outcast. In 1836, the HMS Beagle returned to England after five long years at sea. Charles Darwin had begun the journey as a scared young man fresh out of college. He ended it as a confident 27-year-old. He had survived constant seasickness and dangerous natives, and through it all, done brilliant work as a naturalist. During the voyage, he had amassed over 1,500 animals preserved in spirits and nearly 4,000 samples of skin, bone, and dried specimens, many new to Western Europe. The elite of British science lined up to usher this remarkable young man into their select circle. Outwardly, he was the picture of respectability. Inside, he was tormented by the strain of living a double life. Darwin quickly became a fellow of the Geological Society, the active center of people working in the whole area of natural history. Darwin quickly became propelled to the very core of the scientific establishment. He's introduced to the uh, elite gentlemen's club, the Athenaeum. He's running with the great and the good. People who would have damned him and would have ruined his professional reputation had they known that in secret he was a transmutationist. Transmutation, as evolution was called in its early days, dominated his private thoughts. Already convinced that species change, he turned to the next great mystery. By what mechanism are they transformed? A voyage of discovery is not just seeing new sites, but coming home and being able to see the familiar sites with new eyes. And that's exactly what Darwin did when he returned from the Beagle. Uh, he continued his studies and his explorations right in his own backyard of the English countryside. He studied how breeders of horses and pigeons promoted desired characteristics and wondered if nature had used a similar method. By 1838, the outline of his theory was clear. Competition in nature causes species to alter and only those whose mutations are most appropriate to their surroundings prosper. In brief, only the fittest survive. In 1839, he published The Voyage of the Beagle, a lively account of his scientific adventures, much like the books that had fired his imagination back at Cambridge. An immediate bestseller, it confirmed his scientific standing and brought him wide public acclaim. Now 30 years old, he analyzed the question of whether or not to marry. On the plus side, children, a nice soft wife, and a constant companion. The negatives, loss of time, quarreling, and forced to visit relatives. Having pictured himself a wife, a sofa, music, and when he compared that to the reality of where he was living, he decided he had to get married. In fact, he wrote, Mary, 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 QED. Tradition dictated that aristocrats marry close to home, often their own cousins. Charles' first cousin, Emma Wedgwood, was educated, refined, and heir to the Wedgwood pottery dynasty. Darwin found in Emma Wedgwood an attractive person who had many of the characteristics of a mother. And he writes in his letters and in his notebooks that he looked for someone who could take care of him and could give him comfort. Emma was drawn to Darwin's sensitivity and eagerly accepted his proposal of marriage. With their combined family wealth, Darwin need never worry about earning a living. 
They seemed an ideal match, but one conflict threatened their happiness. She was a Christian, and she was deeply concerned that Darwin's free-thinking ways might lead him away from the church and away from salvation. Um, she was afraid that Darwin's lack of belief in a Christian revelation would keep them apart in eternity, and that he would be in hell while she was in heaven. When Emma confided her fears in a letter to Darwin, he broke down in tears. He loved her dearly, but could not pretend to believe in divine salvation. It was a dilemma without solution, and both chose to push it to the background. In 1839, they were married, and three years later, moved from London to the remote English countryside. Darwin's gracious estate, Down House, gave him a safe refuge from which to pursue his radical ideas. Behind the surface of respected scholar, he was committing heresy. In 1842, he wrote a 35-page essay outlining his theory of evolution, sealed it in an envelope, and gave it to Emma, with instructions to publish it if he should suddenly die. Darwin worried at each step, because he recognized very early on that if he was right, then he would be undertaking what he was later to call a revolution in biology. To teach evolution in those years was to declare yourself beyond the scientific pale. You are a pariah. You are dangerous. The last thing a young gentleman on the make wanted to be. Darwin had no choice but to keep his thoughts to himself, and he did so for 20 years after that. The silence may have carried a heavy price. At this point, Darwin was stricken with a violent illness that would plague him for the rest of his life. For weeks at a time, he was tormented by fever, chills, and vomiting. His condition likely had two causes, panic attacks from the stress of his double life and Chagas disease from an insect bite he received in Brazil. The Chagases predisposed him to become sick when other things got him upset. Darwin had established the pattern of becoming extremely violently sick for any emotional disturbance in his life, even to think intense evolutionary thoughts. The vigorous explorer who had climbed mountains struggled to walk the grounds of his country house. For the next 40 years, he would live as a semi-invalid rarely leaving his home, able to work only two or three hours a day. I am grown a dull, old, spiritless dog to what I used to be. It is a bitter mortification to digest the conclusion that the race is for the strong and that I shall probably do little but admire the strides others make in science. Darwin spent much of the 1840s hiding from the secret locked away in his mind. His theory of evolution was too explosive to share with the world. It could ruin his reputation and his family. Chronic health problems limited his workday to just a few hours. Time spent exploring the smallest details of the natural world. He dedicated eight years to an exhaustive analysis of marine barnacles. For a long time, the Darwin household was the world of barnacles. There were barnacles in jars all over the place. There's a story that one of the playmates of one of Darwin's children was visiting, and Darwin's son asked him, well, where does your father work on his barnacles? His illness confined him to Down House and forced him to bring the outside world to him via a far-flung empire of correspondence. He pursued information with the same zeal he had once collected beetles, contacting everyone from sailors to missionaries to naturalists in search of distant specimens and scientific insight. He worked hard. He wrote letters day after day after day, day in and day out, whether ill or well. 
you find Darwin writing to other scientists, exploring ideas. Where did you see this? Where did you find that? Have you ever heard of? So you get this fascinating tension between Darwin, the consummate international scientist, and Darwin, the recluse. At home, all day, every day, he relied on a well-ordered household and the constant attentions of his beloved wife, Emma. She acted as nursemaid and protector, shielding him from unwanted visitors. When he was too tired to work, she would read aloud or play the piano for him. They had 10 children, seven of whom survived into adulthood. In an era of distant and authoritarian fathers, like Darwin's own, Darwin openly loved and adored his children. He was never too busy to pay attention to their interests or to play with them. In fact, one of his sons at the age of four went into Darwin's study and tried to bribe Darwin with a sixpence to leave off work and come out and play with the children. And he was very affectionate. He was deeply attached to his children and liked to have fun with them. Just as Darwin treasured his children, they understood his unusual sensitivity to suffering. When the children had hurt themselves with a little cut or scrape, they would wait in the hallway outside Darwin's study until he left the room and then go in to get the sticking plaster because the sight of their injuries just overwhelmed him and they wanted to spare him the pain. He felt a special bond with his eldest daughter, Annie. A cheery and lighthearted child, she became his constant companion. She was a beautiful child, and Darwin thought that she would be the daughter that would take care of him in his old age. She would play quietly next to his chair while he did his research. The only child that would sit in the study while he worked. At age nine, Annie's bright spirit began to dim. Over a period of months, she grew increasingly weak, resistant to all attempted cures. Darwin frantically consulted one specialist after another. Finally, alone by her bedside, he watched helplessly as she slipped away. He stood by and watched her waste away over Easter weekend, 1851. And when it was done, he knew there could be no resurrection. And I believe that Annie's death, being crushed in the struggle for existence, mocks the end of Darwin's belief in a just moral universe. Her joyousness and animal spirits radiated from her whole countenance and rendered every movement full of life and vigor. When walking with me, she often used to go before, pirouetting in the most elegant way, her face bright with the sweetest smiles. Oh, that she could now know how deeply, how tenderly we do and shall ever love her dear, joyous face. In the aftermath of Annie's death, Darwin renewed the work so long deferred, a public unveiling of his theory of evolution. He spent years writing, refining, perfecting his book, until an incident in 1858 suddenly galvanized him. He had waited 20 years to publish, and now English naturalist Alfred Wallace had independently developed identical views on evolution and natural selection. Darwin was determined to claim public credit for his revolutionary idea and burst into a 13-month frenzy of writing. He knew that his book threatened his reputation and imperiled his children's future. Worst of all, it promised to bring pain to the woman he called his angel. Emma, his wife, was a devout believer. Darwin truly loved, respected, and needed her. And therefore, to do something which would so clearly hurt her was something that he was loath to undertake. And yet it was quite clear to him, right from the beginning, that the view he was putting forward was one which she would find extremely difficult to deal with. Because evolution implied that humans were merely animals without an immortal soul, Christians considered it immoral. Without a soul, 
there is no incentive to lead a good life, no heaven nor hell, no rewards, no punishments. As he struggled to finish his book, Darwin felt like he was suffering for his sins. He had boils, he fell and hurt his leg, he could hardly walk, he was throwing up, and he was trying to correct the proofs of this book, and he was sending off letters to accompany the presentation copies to his Cambridge friends, his clergymen, and he was saying, you belong to crucify me alive, and so on. Really very strong sentiments for fear that they would react against the book that he'd given his life to. He felt the weight of the world on his shoulders. For 20 years, he had struggled against his destiny. For 20 years, he had lived a double life. Now, his silence was over. In November 1859, he published The Origin of Species and waited for the coming storm. In 1859, at age 50, Darwin revealed his theory of evolution in The Origin of Species. It created an immediate uproar. The first printing of 1,250 copies sold out in a single day. Darwin and his theory were maligned and misunderstood. People tend to say today that he said we were descended from monkeys. He never said that. He said that monkeys and humans came from a common ancestor and followed a different path. To Victorian England, evolution from lowly beasts seemed utterly improbable. Darwin was ridiculed, his theory mocked. His flowing white beard was a godsend to caricaturists, inspiring a legion of cartoons comparing him to hairy apes. The Anglican Church reigned as the official state church of England. Darwin's theory implied that the church's authority was at best superfluous, at worst fraudulent. And this was terribly frightening to the pillars of established society. Uh, they liked to look at what had happened in France the century before, where free thinking and radical ideas had encouraged the lower classes to start questioning the order of things, and look what happened. A lot of people lost their heads. Uh, no one wanted to see that kind of thing happening in Britain. In public, debate raged between creationists and Darwinists. Darwin himself weathered the controversy from the safety of Down House. Working behind the scenes to build support for his theory among the scientific elite. Darwin understood the value of public relations. He made a conscientious campaign to convert the 10 or 15 leading men of science into evolutionists and kept a running list of who was undecided, who was for him, and who was against him. Intellectual and public opinion swung slowly in his favor. In 20 years of meticulous analysis, he had amassed overwhelming evidence. No one with an open mind could ignore it. Even some ministers agreed that God could have designed Earth's life so that the creatures he created would evolve and change. In 1871, Darwin published The Descent of Man, for the first time directly linking human ancestry to lower animals. To his surprise, it was greeted without the furor that had surrounded origin. In just a decade, his ideas had become part of the mainstream. With the great burden of evolution finally lifted from his shoulders, his health improved dramatically. The miserable symptoms of over 30 years all but vanished. He prowled the grounds of Down House with renewed vigor, eagerly embarking on a detailed study of worms. The world had changed in the 20 years since the origin of species. While many still disputed Darwin's ideas, no one was ridiculed for discussing them. Darwin became a respected elderly figure and was awarded an honorary degree from Cambridge, 50 years after almost flunking out. His soul was at peace, except for the painful and unresolved conflict with his wife, Emma. 
Emma believed very strongly in eternal life for the Christian saved, and she was very sorrowful at the thought that she and Darwin might not spend that life together. The religious split grew more poignant as their final years approached. In April 1882, the 73-year-old Darwin suffered a major heart attack. He spent the few days left him, like much of his life, comforted by his beloved Emma. When he dies, literally in her arms, his head resting on her breast as he takes his last breaths, he keeps saying that he hopes that somehow they'll be able to remain together. But he knows that by her lights, she will go into an afterlife and he will not. His death ignited one final controversy, his burial site. His family was surprised by requests that his body be interred in Westminster Abbey. The times thundered. The Abbey needed it more than it needed the Abbey because Darwin had annexed new territories, being the great imperialist, new territories of knowledge, and planted the, the flag of science in new realms. England had claimed its rebellious son as one of her own. On April 26, 1882, the elite of British society gathered in the churchyard of Westminster Abbey to see Darwin laid to rest beside Sir Isaac Newton. An agnostic who had undermined Christian authority would spend eternity in consecrated ground. In the century since his death, the origin of species has been reprinted 400 times in 29 languages. His principle of change through natural forces has forever altered how we see the world. Once the origin of species had been published, God was pushed to the side in area after area as natural explanation took over. All phenomena in living things, including humans, including their social organization, including their behavior, all of these are developed and controlled through natural forces. Darwin changed our view of the world forever, as few men have done in the course of history. He really did usher in a new era in, in science and in popular culture as well. It's fascinating to me that his name appears in the newspapers and magazines, even on television, almost every day. There's some mention of Charles Darwin, which really brings it home to me. And in fact, uh, I've had people come up and say, can I touch you? Because they find out I'm a great grandson. And I, I'm absolutely amazed by that. Darwin had devoted his life to uncovering nature's great secrets. At his funeral, the Abbey Choir sang a specially commissioned hymn with lyrics from the book of Proverbs. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and giveth understanding.